everyone, and welcome to Varsity Tutors, where today we're climbing aboard the Adaptation Express with our friends at Wonders of Wildlife to learn all about the ways that animals of all different shapes, sizes, feathers, and furs can change those qualities to survive and thrive in their surroundings. And we're even going to get to see how some of those animals put their adapta adaptations into action with some very special guest interactions later on in today's lesson. Now, you want to have that Adaptation Express ticket handy. But if you didn't get the email or if you don't have it in front of you, not to worry, you can draw one along yourself and follow along or just tune in and follow along at our stops on screen. Now, we're also gonna have the opportunity to test our knowledge of these adaptations a bit. So feel free to use the chat panel on the right-hand side of your screen to both ask and answer questions throughout the lesson. And if we don't get to those questions right away, we're gonna be saving about 10 minutes at the end of the lesson specifically for Q&A. You'll also want to be sure that you have your cameras close by because we're going to have an opportunity to lean into the screen and pose for a selfie, possibly with one of our animal guests today. I won't spoil too much. And if you post those selfies on Instagram and you tag us here at Varsity Tutors, as well as Wonders of Wildlife, you'll be entered to win a one month membership to After School Discovery Club. I'll talk a little bit more about that prize and how to enter toward the end of today's lesson. But for now, I'm going to pass it along to your educator, conductor, instructor for today, Audrey Moore. And lots of titles today. Well, hello everyone. My name is Audrey and like Haley said, I am an educator here at Wonders of Wildlife National Museum and Aquarium. Um, I hope that I'm a familiar face to some of you and if this is your first class with us, well, welcome. We are excited to have you either way. Um, what I like to do whenever we get started with these classes is I like to know where you guys are from. So if you want to go ahead and type in the chat box where you are from, um, just what state or what country you are in, I love to see those results and those answers. I'm currently in Springfield, Missouri, if you didn't know where Wonders of Wildlife is. Um, born and raised here in Springfield, it's a great place to be, great place to work. Um, I'm seeing lots of really great answers. Lots of them are coming in. I see New York, the Alabama, California, Arizona. Man, you guys are spread out everywhere. Oh, there's a fellow Missourian. I see those as well. Awesome. Well, I will go ahead and make sure that I look at those a little bit later on because like I said, I love to see where you guys are from. But before we get started, if you don't live in Missouri and you don't know what Wonders of Wildlife is, I did want to give you a brief introduction as to where I am. I like to do this at the beginning of all of my classes so that you get to experience part of the aquarium as well. So Wonders of Wildlife is a completely immersive experience into the environments of the world. From ocean to land, there are over 1.5 million or sorry, 1.5 miles of exhibits to see, and we have over 800 different species to share with you. Today, we will be focusing on our exhibit that showcases some of, um, or not, sorry. Today, we will be focusing on some animals that are going to showcase some of these winter adaptations. Um, adaptations kind of more broad, and then winter adaptations to kind of go into the rest. So as we hop on to that Adaptation Express, we will follow along. But I like to share those pictures with you because it's a pretty cool place to look at. So let's go ahead and hop aboard the Adaptation Express and begin our journey to travel around the globe. So along the way, we will discover lots of really cool information about adaptations. And towards the beginning, It'll take us a little bit to get to our first stop, but once we hit our first stop, we're gonna be stopping um, along several different stations pretty quickly. So as we're going through, just make sure that you are paying attention, follow, following along, and I hope that we have a really great time on this virtual train ride around the world trying to look at these adaptations. So like I said, it may take us a little bit to get there and it'll be a little quicker, but I do wanna make sure that in this long trek to our first station that you guys are experts in adaptations. So I know the last couple of classes we've talked about adaptations. And if you have been with us for those classes, I'm sure you guys are already experts, but I just wanna double check. And if not, I wanna teach those who don't know what maybe an adaptation is. So what is an adaptation? Anybody have any guesses? It's a really big word. Sometimes it's kind of hard to understand, but it does have a definition. 
Well, I'll tell it to you if you don't know, and I'm seeing some great answers in the chat box as well. So an adaptation is a change or a process by which an animal or species becomes better suited to its environment. So that's a lot of really big words for something that an animal has or does to help it survive. Now, did you know that there are three types of adaptations? Now, if you remember from the last class, you might already know these, but they are structural, physiological, and behavioral, which are really, really big words as well. So let's go ahead and break those down. So for structural, we have a body part that aids in survival. So we have thumbs. That's one of our adaptations to help us survive. We know that cheetahs have really, really long and strong legs that help them run super, super fast. So that's an a couple examples of structural. Then we also have physiological. So those are jobs of a certain body part that control the processes that help them survive, which again is really, really big for things that your body does inside to help you survive. So we digest food or when we're hot, we sweat. Those are some different physiological processes that happen and they can be kind of structural as well, but those are how we stay alive and don't get too hot. So the last one is behavioral, and this is an action that aids in survival. So a way that an animal acts to make sure that it stays alive. And we'll look at a couple of these later on, and each of our examples that we have later will have either a structural, physiological, or behavioral adaptation style to them, okay? So now that you know what an adaptation is, why do you think they're important? I kind of gave you a hint earlier. So if you want to type it in the, in the chat box and let me know why you think that adaptations are important, I would love to see what you have to say, but I did say it earlier. So just remember that. Remember that they have these certain things really for one really important purpose. Right, it's to help them stay alive and to survive. There are certain things that they do that help them live their life, right? We have certain things like our thumbs that help us stay alive. So animals and even some plants have those as well. So here we go again. Besides daily lifestyle things like finding food or staying hidden or moving a specific way, what are some other factors that might cause an animal to need to adapt or develop an adaptation? So I'll ask that question again, because it was kind of wordy. What are some other factors that might cause an animal to need to adapt or develop an adaptation? So go ahead and type those in the chat box, or if you don't want to type them, you can always think out these answers. Um, it really doesn't matter either way to me. It's whatever you're most comfortable with, but um, I love to see what you guys have to say as well. But one that I was thinking of while I wait for some more answers to come in, give you a little bit of time to type, one of the ones that I think of right off the bat is natural disasters. So uh, tornadoes, hurricanes, really big like snowstorms, wildfires, tsunamis, stuff like that. Those might have an animal adapt really, really quickly, right? They have to adapt to the situation and maybe change where they're living at and kind of move to a different place for a little bit. Or they may have to develop a certain way that they hop onto a rock to avoid extra water in the area or something along those lines. So that's one reason um, that an animal might need to adapt or develop um, a new adaptation. And those, like I said, that was natural disasters. I'm seeing some really good answers in here as well. Let's look through these. So I have lack of water. That's a really good one because if you don't have water, your body's going to have to figure out how you're going to survive without um, a, a a bounty or a huge amount of uh, water. And then we have ooh, parasites, that's a really good one. So some animals are able to remove those parasites or get rid of those parasites. And then unfortunately some aren't able to, but yeah, that would be a really helpful adaptation to be able to remove parasites. I like that one. Ooh, avoiding predators, that's another good one too. We know that most animals do have a predator um, that is around them at some point. 
And yeah, that's a really, really good idea. We talked about some of those last class, like camouflage or um, yeah, camouflage was a big one. We also have, like we talked about just a second ago with the cheetah and their long, strong legs that also might help them run away from predators, even though they're a pretty ferocious predator themselves. Well, I will tell you one more that I was thinking of and it was seasons. So kind of like what we have going on right now here in Missouri, we've got some crazy winter weather, but that was one of the seasons. Do you know what a season is? Yeah, so a season is a period of the year that is kind of categorized or put into a category by special climate conditions. So it's just changing climates throughout the year or changing kind of temperatures, the amount of rain or snow, um, amount of sunshine. Uh, daylight is a factor in that as well. So on Earth, we have mostly four seasons. Do you know what the four seasons are? Can you just list them out loud what the four seasons are? Let's list them together. So I have spring, summer, fall, and winter. Now, it is important to note that not all places on Earth have equal um, seasons. Some areas have shorter or longer seasons. Some um, don't really have seasons at all. Um, they have little to no seasons, or some areas have pretty even seasons. So they kind of cut the year into four, and every three months is when they get a new season. So to you, when you think of winter, and you can say this answer out loud as well, what do you think of um, when you think of winter? I know I definitely think of cold because it is very, very cold right now here in Missouri. What else do you think of? Yeah, so I'm thinking inclement weather like snow or ice. Now, if I was an animal, I would think that food might be harder to find, right? And I know that it gets darker outside as well, so the days might be a little bit shorter. Now, I do want to mention that over um, or all around the world, there are different um, seasons and the way seasons are affecting those areas is a little bit different. But I know definitely here in the US, um, we have certain areas that kind of cross across all of those categories. So I just wanted to mention it now. How do you think that animals might adapt to winter? We're getting really close to our first station, so I don't want you to lose hope here because this is really, really close, and I want to make sure you guys are experts by the end of this little stretch and before we get to our first station. So, like I said, how do animals adapt to winter weather condition or winter season conditions? All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, and then we'll talk about them a little bit more. And I have plenty of questions throughout this um, presentation in this class. So I want to make sure that we are chugging along on our Adaptation Express. So the first one will be dormancy. That is how animals might adapt to winter conditions. Now, dormancy is a big word for resting or taking a nap, um, sleep. They just, they remain dormant. They remain calm and usually sleepy as well. Then the second one is they move. So they might move to another area that isn't quite as cold. The third is what I like to call tough it out or they tolerate those conditions. So they stick around and they just tough it out. Um, we as humans usually do that as well. We put on our coat and we tough out the cold or we tough out the snow. So I think that you guys are all real true experts in adaptations now. So let's go ahead and make our first stop at our first adaptation station to learn some more specific examples of these types of adaptations. So on your slide here, you see adaptation station number one, we finally arrived. Now, do you know what that big word that starts with an H means at the top of your screen. I'll read it out loud to you because you might have heard it before. It's called hibernation. Now, 
you maybe think about what hibernation means or what it is. I know that you guys might know what this is because it's pretty common. And if you're an animal lover like myself, I would hope that you know it. But if you do not, that is okay because I'm here to tell you. So hibernation is a way for animals to conserve energy. And it is a way for them to survive cold weather conditions or wet weather conditions where there's also not a whole lot of food around. And it also involves those physiological changes. So remember that was one of our types of adaptations. It's one of those, um, they belong on the inside and your body kind of changes on the inside to help them survive. Well, they have a lot of those that happen in this hibernation period and their body temperature will drop their metabolism, which gives them energy um, or which they burn to give them energy will slow down to help them kind of save their energy. So think of it as a really, really deep sleep where your body just kind of moves in slow motion, right? And they will also like to eat a lot in the summer, in the fall to make sure that they have enough fat to get them through the really, really big nap. So we notice that a lot of mammals and um, usually small or large mammals will be the ones that are hibernating. So they will make sure to eat a ton of food and to give their bodies lots of nutrients before they take their really big nap. I know that's one of my favorite things to do is eat a good snack and take a good nap. I love that. <laughs> awesome. Well, we are going to go to our adaptation station number two. I told you these stations come pretty quick once we got to the first one. So this next one is a little bit different. You see the word at the top that starts with a B. It's called brumation. What do you think brumation might mean? And how might it be similar to something that we've already talked about? Well, I will tell you that remember that hibernation is mostly for mammals. Now, brumation might be something for another type of animal that you see on the screen. So these two animals, I'll give you a hint, are reptiles. So brumation is known as the hibernation of cold-blooded animals, which reptiles are. So hibernation is that really deep, longer version of a nap for these guys. Now, brumation, on the other hand, is really specific to reptiles and amphibians, and they pretty much just enter a deep sleep where a lot of their body goes through the same processes and the same um, physiological changes, but um, they are kind of able to wake up from those and just kind of, it's not quite as deep as hibernation. And like we said, the hibernation is going to be more for warm blooded animals, whereas brumation is for cold blooded. Now I keep saying all of these things like warm blooded and cold blooded, but I want to make sure that everyone knows what those are as well. So I'm warm blooded, you're warm blooded because our body temperature stays the same all the time. And we might have a fever here and there, but it doesn't go really, really high or really, really low all the time. Sometimes just when we're sick or when we're not feeling well, or if we've spent too much time outside in the cold, it might be a little bit lower as well. But our friends that are cold-blooded, like reptiles, amphibians, they are not at a constant body temperature or at the same body temperature their body temperature depends on what's around them. So if it's really, really hot, their body temperature is going to be really, really hot. And if it's really, really cold, they're going to be really, really cold as well. So I think that we have taken a few stops here already, and I think it's time to meet our first friend. So let me grab him out really quick. I will give you a hint on what he might be. You can kind of guess in your head what this friend might be. So this friend, he is, he has four legs and he's a reptile. And we just talked about cold-blooded. He is in fact cold-blooded. 
and this friend does go through brumation. All right, are you ready to meet him? This is my friend Tippy. So Tippy is a three-toed box turtle. And for his brumation, he has some really special things that he goes through in this process. And these guys can actually roommate for up to five months of the year. Now, remember that there's only 12 months in a year, so they can roommate for almost half a year, which is a really, really big nap. Now, this does unfortunately leave them vulnerable to predators. So that can be kind of scary. He'd be sleeping in his den and um, there would be predators around. So he'd have to be really, really careful. But remember that on warm winter days or even warm fall days, he can wake up. Um, it's not like hibernation where he's in a totally, totally deep sleep. Kind of looks silly with his arms all stretched out like that, huh? He's just trying to find a place to rest his arms. Mr. Tippy loves to walk around and move around. So him being in my hand, he's not really sure about all this. <laughs> but I will bring him a little closer so you can see he's got beautiful, beautiful colors. And he always wears his home on his back. Now he does have a really, really um, big head and he's got these really cute little legs right here and right here. He's got four of them and he has the ability to close himself or kind of tuck himself into his shell. Um, he can't quite close himself all the way, but um, he can tuck himself all the way into that shell. He's a pretty cute fella, but I think we should get back to brumation. He's pretty distracting me over here. Um, so like I said, he can wake up on those warm winter days and um, something kind of silly that I was looking at on whenever I was building this lesson was that turtles actually stop eating and they will brumate on an empty stomach. So they won't eat before their nap and then they don't eat for quite a while, which I think is kind of crazy. But remember, it's not as deep of a sleep as hibernation. So he can always wake up and go find himself a meal as well. Now, remember, since they are cold blooded, he won't be able to regulate his body temperature. So if it's 30 degrees outside, his body temperature will be the same as that in his burrow. So he's not totally just exposed to the elements. He usually tries to find himself a burrow, but um, it still will be pretty chilly in that little area. They don't always brumate. Um, if they're in an area that doesn't get super, super cold, then um, that's okay and he won't brumate, but they can um, do it if they need to. And I will mention, as I have Tippy on screen, uh, we will have a formal photo opportunity at the end. So I promise that one of our animals will be out for that photo opportunity. But if you'd like to snap a picture of Tippy uh, while he's out on screen, I'll try to get some good angles and have him work the camera for you. He's a little wiggly this, this evening, but um, I will tell you one really cool fact about Tippy. So he is a three-toed box turtle. And Tippy looks pretty small. He's about the size of my hand, but he's quite an old turtle. Would you, um, would you believe me if I told you that our friend Tippy was born around 1950? So he's around like 72 years old, which is really, really crazy to me. He's quite the old man, but he loves to walk around. He's super active. So he is going to have a great life um, as he already has here at Wonders of Wildlife. He's very well fed. He loves him some lettuce and he loves blackberries. Those are some of his favorite foods. Well, I hope that you got some really good pictures of our friend Tippy, and I'm gonna go ahead and put him away and we'll move on. But um, Tippy will maybe be back in a little bit. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and put him up really quick. So bear with me here. And um, as we kind of move on, I think that it's time for us to hit another adaptation station. What do you think? I think we're ready. So this is adaptation station number three. 
So I mentioned that cold-blooded animals can't regulate their body temperature. And I know this doesn't necessarily have anything to do with winter, but I thought it was really good to talk about because we've already talked about hibernation, which is naps for mammals mostly. And then we talked about brumation, which is naps for reptiles and amphibians. But we didn't talk about what might happen if it's too hot outside. So we have this phenomena, which is where animals in hot clim climates also go undergo some kind of hibernation. And this works in a similar way, but it helps them to, ex to survive extreme heat, drought, or where there might not be a lot of food. So I thought that would be kind of cool to show you because I didn't really know a whole lot about it until I was reading about it um, I would say around last year, and I thought it was really, really good to share as we were talking about the other two types of naps for animals in the winter. <laughs> awesome. So I think that we are going to go ahead and quickly move to our adaptation station number four, and this is migration. Now, I want you to tell me what you think migration is. And you can use the clues on the screen to maybe help you along with your answer. So we see these geese on the right hand side. There are, um, they're in the form of a V and they're flying somewhere it looks like, but I'm not really sure where, maybe you know. And these whales on the other side are migrating as well. So what do we think migration might mean? They're not really in one spot. Kind of looks like they're traveling to me, doesn't it? I mean, they don't have a suitcase or anything like that. They're not on an airplane, but kind of looks to me like they're moving somewhere, right? Well, migration is the travel of animals from one place to another. And this is typically to find or search for food and warmer temperatures because when it gets too cold they say you know what i'm going on vacation and they go somewhere else for the winter now not all animals will migrate um, the ones that don't go into hibernation or brumation or tough it out will usually migrate in some way some go farther than others and then like i said others stay a little bit closer to their home area but temperature changes. So when the temperature starts to drop and get a little colder and when the days get shorter, so when we have our daylight savings time switch over and all of that stuff is usually around the time that animals will start to migrate for winter. Now, um, birds and insects might use a special migration pattern and sometimes it remains the same year after year, which I thought was a really, really cool fact. Now for these migrations, like I said, they can be short, they can be long. Um, I do have a friend though, that has quite a long migration period. So bear with me here. This one might take me a little bit longer to get out, but as we are going through, I'll go ahead and give you some hints about our friend. So this one is the same. Uh, we will have a formal photo opportunity at the end, but if you would like to take a picture with this friend, you are more than welcome to. You see that I'm grabbing a glove and you'll also see that I have this kind of rope looking thing. Um, our friend is an animal with wings. And what I'm going to be doing is holding him. So the glove protects my arm. And then we have our friend who will um, be out in just a second. And he is on this cord, which helps to keep him and myself safe. So we like to keep him close by. Can you step up? We've got some kids on camera that want to see you. I guess not kids, it's fun for all ages, huh? Hi, Bob. Hello. So this is my friend Oliver. And Oliver is really not sure what's going on at the moment, but he's kind of looking around. He's observing the area. He just went to the restroom. So Oliver is a bird, obviously, but 
He is more specifically a Swainson's hawk. He's really not sure what's going on right now, huh? Well, he is a beautiful, beautiful boy. Yes, I'm talking about you, friend. So you might see Oliver hop off screen for a minute and that's okay. We call that baiting. And sometimes he likes to try to fly away, but I promise he is safe on my glove. Now, let's talk a little bit about Oliver and how he would migrate in the wild. So, like I said, they are very, very long distance migrators. Hello. They are very, very long distance migrators. So they usually live here in the northern part of um, North America. So here in the United States, they live kind of out west, but they do live in North America. And during their migration period, so in the winter, they will fly south but not just south, they'll fly super south, sorry. <laughs> he scared me a little bit. They will fly super south and they will end up in areas like Argentina, Chile, and they hang out there and vacation for quite a while during the winter and then they will migrate back. So these guys migrate in large flocks and can travel for multiple days without eating food. So as you just saw, he's got a pretty large wingspan as well, which helps him fly those really, really long distances. He also has a pretty, pretty light body. So he likes to um, stay pretty light and he does so with his beautiful feathers. Um, his feathers really help to keep his body weight down. Um, he also can regulate his body weight a little bit. Give me just a second here. I'm going to readjust him so he has a little bit more space. There we go. Good bird. Yeah, right. <laughs> he's a little camera shy, I think, but he's doing really, really well. So he is um, super light because he has these bones that are kind of hollow. Um, they kind of look like a kitchen sponge if you were to look at them. And he is able to stay light because those bones aren't full of anything. Sometimes his wings are a little large and he likes to hit me in the face. That's why I kind of pull my head away when he does that. I like to give him the space. What do you think? I think I should give you your space. <laughs> so um, back to what I was saying where I was kind of interrupted. Are you okay? <laughs> so he loves to, um, keep himself light also with those hollow bones, but he also uses his special feathers to serve different purposes, right? So obviously he needs them to fly and to help him build um, energy, but he will use his tail feathers to help him kind of stay balanced on my glove or his perch or wherever he might be. He also, hello, <laughs> he has down feathers, which help keep him warm. So if he's in an area that might be a little bit chillier, then he will, um, he will have a little bit of protection. It's almost like his built-in coat. What do you think? He looks like he's looking around. He's really not sure what's going on here, huh? All right. You're okay. You gonna show me your wings? <laughs> awesome. Well, that is all I have to know about Oliver at the moment. I really don't want to get hit. I know. If you want more space, you're okay. Fix your feet. Oh, hello. Can you fix your feet? Awesome. Well, I am going to go ahead and put our friend Oliver away. So give me just a few seconds here. Um, we may have to adjust just a little bit, but I will get him put away. So as we are doing so, I'm going to let you know why we have friends like Oliver and Tippy here. And these are what we call animal ambassadors. And these animal ambassadors help us teach people just like you about animals that you may not get to see every day. How many people get to say that they saw a hawk today? <laughs> All right. All right. Good bird. You're okay. Awesome. I'm going to get him back in his crate really quick. Give me just a second here. You are being very dramatic for this 
group today. They just want to see your beautiful face. Give me just a second. Nope. You can't go in that way. Sorry, Bubby. You can't do it. Put your wings away. Thank you. Good bird. Put your wings away. <laughs> awesome. Just a minute, friend. Oh, not as smooth as we would have liked, but that's okay. Awesome. Sorry about that. Sometimes he likes to stay out and hang out with us, but unfortunately, we got to put him away for just a little bit. All right. I'll tie him off really quickly and we'll get back to business. All right. Well, that was fun. Now, I think it's time for us to move on to our next adaptation station, which is one of those toughing it out examples that we talked about earlier, those tolerance examples. So what do you notice about the bears on the screen? What do you notice about the bears compared to the human and then maybe the black bear, maybe the grizzly, the polar bear? And then think about where those bears might live. What do you think these might be comparing? Well, we know that animals that live in winter um, or really, really cold areas where winter is maybe extended or it's year round, it seems like, these really, really cold areas will have larger size. So these animals will be a little bit bigger than what you would find maybe in a climate that's a little bit warmer. And um, what we will also see is that this trend happens mostly with birds and mammals. And it's not always true, but we do find quite a few examples in nature. This larger body size means that there's more body to um, retain heat with. So it's easier for them to keep their heat in. That's why polar bears are usually larger than tropical bears. Uh, we also notice things like white-tailed deer in maybe say Michigan or Wisconsin, those Northern states here in the US might have higher weights than those in say Texas or Florida, those more Southern warmer states because they just really don't need to put on all the weight because they don't have to deal with um, those really, really cold environments and things like snow and things like that. So I think it's time to go ahead and stop at our next station. And we have this next one that is another example of toughing it out. And these are two kinds of rabbits. But what do you notice about the rabbits that might be a little bit different? So obviously one lives in a warm climate, the one on your right, and then one lives on a more cold climate in a colder area. That's obviously with all the snow on the left-hand side. So what do you think is different between them? Well, we obviously notice that their um, fur is different colors. And we talked about that last class with camouflage whatever color their fur is, it will help them blend into the snow or to the sand or grass. But we notice that animals who live in colder climates, areas where it's colder, tend to have smaller um, body parts than those in the South. And that is because the smaller their ears might be. So for these rabbits, the um, Snowshoe hare has smaller ears than say a cottontail rabbit. So their ears are a little smaller and the pictures kind of aren't um, quite as great of a comparison, but I thought you could still kind of see how their ears are different sizes and that actually helps them to keep in heat. So if there's not as much showing, it's less um, surface area for their ears to get cold and they can keep their body heat in. Now we also notice things like legs and snouts on mammals are usually a little bit shorter and stouter, kind of meatier, chunkier, whatever you wanna call it. Um, they're usually bigger um, and a little bit shorter. 
All right, let's move on to our next adaptation station. I have adaptation station number seven. Do you think that these two animals are the same? Really look closely and compare the two. Do you think that they are the same? Or do you think that they might be different? Go ahead and type in the chat box, yes or no, if you think these are the same. I think that you guys will get this one. I believe in you. <laughs> really look at them, really look at their fur, really look at the environment around them. Ooh, I might be tricking you with those clues though. All right, well, I will spoil the surprise and tell you that they are in fact the same animal. Now, birds and mammals usually undergo seasonal changes in their feathers and um, their fur. And what we notice is that their hair is usually thicker and they might even have different kinds of hair in the winter. So these are both gray wolves on your screen. On the left, you have your gray wolf in the summer. And on the right, you have your gray wolf in the winter. Both beautiful, beautiful wolves, but unfortunately one is in the summer, one is in the winter, and they are in fact the same animal. All right, quickly jumping in to unfortunately the last stop on our journey. We have adaptation station number eight. Now, again, another question. Do you think that these animals are the same? Do you think maybe they could be the same animal? Are they maybe related to one another or are they totally different? Maybe just think this answer in your head. Just think, are they the same? Are they different? Or maybe they're related, but they're not exactly the same animal. Well, I will tell you that these are in fact the same animal. So snowshoe hares, weasels, and these guys, the Arctic fox, can change color um, as winter approaches. So their fur or their feathers, depending if they are a mammal or a bird, can change from usually about a brown to a white, which gives them a huge advantage. Um, it actually gives them two advantages. The first is that when they grow that new fur, it can be thicker and act as a better insulator than maybe their brown summer coat. So it's almost like they change clothes, but they grow their own clothes. Then they also have color changes will help them to stay camouflaged. So the first advantage is that it helps them stay warm. The second is that, again, it helps them with camouflage to not only avoid predators, but to hunt their prey. Whew. Man, I'm exhausted. What a journey we have been on. We've met some really cool creatures and we've also seen some really cool adaptations that help these animals survive cold winters. I think you are extremely well-traveled at this point and super well-educated pass passengers. And I think that you deserve to show off your ticket that you received earlier. So I think Haley, it is time for our photo op, but make sure that your name is on your ticket now or after the picture, whatever you're most comfortable with, so that everyone knows that you completed this awesome journey alongside us. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and grab out a friend before our picture. All right, and while Audrey grabs our friend, as a quick reminder, we would love to have you post these selfies on Instagram, tag us here at Varsity Tutors and Wonders of Wildlife, and you will not only get to show off the adventure that we went on today, you'll also have the opportunity to win a one-month membership to After School Discovery Club, where you can learn all about animals, but also science and STEM and coding and all sorts of other fun activities, so definitely check that out, and it looks like Tippy is more than ready for our selfie, so I'll pass it back along to Audrey and Tippy. Um, I'll try to move him around a little bit for you guys get some good angles. Maybe show you his shell and his crazy arms. He's sticking out. He looks like he's ready to party. <laughs> he's a little wiggly, so I may have to move him around a little bit. Oh, he's throwing his hands up in the air. <laughs> can you give me your hands so that I can? There we go. <laughs> kind of got his arms out. He looks kind of silly. Can I have your arm? There we go. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Audrey, and thank you to Tippy. And we've got some really wonderful questions that we'll have just a few moments to get to a couple of uh, whenever you are ready. Absolutely. I am ready. And I think that Tippy would like to hang out and answer some questions with me. What do you think? Think that's a good idea? I think that's a good idea. Very <laughs> cool. Awesome. All right. So we had lots of questions about both of the animal ambassadors today. Absolutely. Lots of very particular questions about Oliver from his age to his wingspan to a little bit more about how you came to uh, to care for Oliver. So could you talk to us a little bit more about Oliver's story and some, cool, some more cool stuff about him? Yeah. So Oliver is one of my favorite animals to work with, no matter if he's being a little dramatic like he was on screen today. He's kind of a diva. Um, and we love that most about him. He's got quite the personality, but um, Oliver is a Swainson's hawk. Um, he was born in the wild. All of our birds here at Wonders of Wildlife are rehab non-release, which means unfortunately they were injured in the wild and they have some kind of injury that they are fully healed from, but there have been some kind of um, reasoning behind why they can't be put back into the wild, unfortunately. So for Oliver, um, he is fully healed from his injury, but cannot be released back into the wild because it'd be really hard for him to find food. So we keep him here at Wonders of Wildlife. He lives an awesome life. He loves to go outside and soak up the sun. He also loves, like actually dances for um, his some of his meals, he'll kind of dance around and tweet around for, um, he loves insects. He also loves to eat mice. Um, those are probably his favorite snacks, uh, which sound kind of gross to us, but he loves them. Um, I'm trying to think anything else kind of cool or awesome about Oliver. He's obviously gorgeous to look at. Um, but yeah, I think that's good enough. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, and we also had some some students who were wondering and wanted to learn a little bit more from um, kind of the lead that Oliver was on when you had him here to show to us to the enclosure that he was in that you put him back into when he went off screen. Talk to us a little bit more about some of the tools that help keep Oliver safe while he's here educating us and how that's different from maybe the environment that he would spend the rest of his time uh, at, at at Wonders of Wildlife. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm actually going to put Tippy up because I can show you some of the equipment that we use for him. So give me just a second. Let me put Tippy up really quick. So um, obviously we use the glove to protect our hand, but the glove also has a little ring that I can tie um, Oliver's string to. This one, you can't see it, but what I had him kind of attached to. Um, and we tie that off so that way if my hand slips or I lose grip of him here, he's still tied to the glove. Um, the reason that we do that, I promise it does not hurt him. The things around his ankles are called jesses, and that's a really, really common falconry technique um, to ensure that he doesn't fly away and hurt himself or others. Um, it's really, really important for us to ensure the safety of our animals. So I kind of noticed as we were getting towards the end of him being on screen that he was a little stressed out and that's why I kind of wanted to put him away so quickly. And that's why it kind of was a weird transition for us, but um, he always likes to tell me his moods. And so we're pretty good at communicating in that way. His enclosure that he's in, he loves it. Since I kind of put him up, he was, he's roused, which is where he pulled all of his feathers up and he gets really, really poofy and big. And then he kind of shakes them out. That means he's comfortable that he's back to relaxed. So I'm glad that I heard that once I put him away. It is dark, um, which is a really comforting thing for him. Um, this is definitely not what he lives in. Um, I can show you the box. He does not live in this, <laughs> this little container. He has quite a big enclosure actually, has lots of branches. He actually got a new mirror so he can make sure he looks good for the ladies in that mirror. Lots of toys, we give them enrichment. Sometimes we give them um, like crawdads or insects, which are some of his favorites to kind of move around. So we try to mimic as much natural stimuli as possible for him. Again, we have an outdoor mew that he loves to go in and soak up the sun as well. So those are some of the things we do um, to kind of mimic his natural environment because like I said earlier, unfortunately he can't be released, but we wanna give him as happy and as close to natural of a life we can um, while he's in human care. 
Awesome. That is amazing. And I know if, for those of us who were able to join for some of our earlier lessons, we actually got to talk a little more about some of the specifics on how you communicate to the animals and how you understand what the animals are communicating to you on how comfortable they're feeling and how prepared they're feeling to help educate versus maybe be a little more shy and that you've always got to be on your toes to make sure you're responding to that communication. Uh, now, this actually brings up my next question. We had lots of students who were wondering um, what other sorts of animals you have at Wonders of Wildlife. So we got to see a couple today. We get to see even more on screen that you mentioned uh, potentially having some experience with. So talk to us a little bit about the types of animals you care for at Wonders of Wildlife. Absolutely. So we spend, we as educators spend plenty of time with our ambassador animals. Um, we have, oh goodness, quite a few that we do take out on excursions. And I, I like to spend as much time with these animals as possible, like we all do, um, to ensure that we do know those cues. Like earlier, when we first got Oliver out, I kind of ducked out of the way because I knew he was going to do it, but he didn't quite do it yet. So when it comes to Kind of spreading his wings out. So we definitely learn those cues and uh, we go through extensive training to make sure that our animals are comfortable because at the end of the day if they're uncomfortable it's not only unsafe but it's kind of unfair to them as well. So we always want to make sure that they are as comfortable as possible and um, that goes not only for our ambassador animals that we take places or show here at the aquarium but also the ones that are residents to the aquarium and stay there full time. Um, for the animals that are animal ambassadors, we like to hang out with them um, and take them on programs um, in our community. Sometimes we travel with them a little farther than maybe an hour or so. Uh, we also do live animal encounters in our aquarium, stuff like that. Um, I feel like I'm missing another part of the question. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's quite all right. We had some students who, well, Many students who wanted to know if you have or don't have particular animals, but to kind of generalize uh, what, what sorts of species you care for at Wonders of Wildlife. Absolutely. So we do have birds of prey like Oliver or you guys met Sabo on our last live stream if you have watched that one. Um, we also have other birds of prey like uh, great horned owl. Then we have some smaller mammals. So we have a hedgehog. We have a three-banded armadillo, and then um, a couple other mammals, and then we have a huge room full of reptiles and amphibians. So we have an American alligator, several species of snake, um, a couple different fox turtles, including our friend Tippy, and um, a couple amphibians as well, mostly frogs and salamanders, um, and an alligator snapping turtle. Just some really, really neat animals that you may see, um, we try to keep um, track of which animals we have, and try to um, kind of cover the different areas of the world a little bit with those animals, but yeah. Very cool. I know you mentioned frogs and amphibians, and this leads me to possibly my last question of the day. So we had some students who were wondering some specific stories that they've heard about animals that maybe freeze completely when they undergo hibernation, or perhaps one of those other more fitting terms, uh, or species that, to your point, maybe hibernate for a really, really long portion of the year. So could you tell us a little bit about any particularly cool or interesting examples of animals that undergo some some pretty extreme hibernation or adaptations of different sorts. Absolutely. So I picked Tippy as um, one of the animals to join us today because like we talked about, he hibernates for up to five, or he brewmates, sorry, for up to almost five months of the year, which I thought was crazy. That's almost half a year. Um, in terms of animals freezing, like completely, um, I know that can be an adaptation in some way, but that also can be the unfortunate um, happenings of they didn't, their body didn't process the cold as much as it should have. And fortunately that could be the end for some, but for others, they can adapt through that and then kind of come out of that state as well. So I do know that um, that does happen. And like we talked about, even when Tippy was out, when they're in those hibernation or brumation periods, it does leave them vulnerable to not only that exposure to those cold elements or those different kinds of elements, but also he could just be eaten, which is kind of sad to think about, but I mean, that's nature. <laughs> Aww. 
Well, uh, we got to talk all about all sorts of the amazing creatures at Wonders of Wildlife and out in nature. Uh, so I guess we'll leave with this final question. Do you have any other thoughts that you'd like to leave for students who are interested in learning more about animals, more about animal care, or animal education, or more about what you do at Wonders of Wildlife? Yeah, definitely. So um, I'll start with what I do here at WOW. So I'm an educator. Um, we talk about topics from camouflage to winter adaptations to, I have a degree in marine biology. So we do lots of marine science stuff. Uh, we talk about history, we talk about science, conservation, all of that. Um, so that's kind of what a general overview of what we teach here at WOW. But I will tell you that if you are interested in a career in either education, like conservation education, or animal care, or you just love animals and you wanna learn more, I highly, highly recommend that you find a specific area that you are really, really interested in, or you just love animals in general, just learn. It's always important to find things like this to kind of learn more information, see what you think might be cool, and maybe down the road you could turn it into a career. I know that I did. Um, and so I think always learning and being ready to absorb new and cool information is always a good way to start. Um, another way besides our varsity tutors live streams that we have, we also have something called mission conservation. This is a virtual scavenger hunt that you can play, but as you're playing, you might realize that you're actually learning along the way. And that's one of my favorite parts about it is it's a way for you to learn about conservation and animals as you're doing something really fun. You can play those at home and you can find all of this information on the Wonders of Wildlife website. But I encourage you to continue to come to these Varsity Tutors live streams as well because I always will make sure that we have some kind of really awesome information or cool animal to show you as well. And always try to give you more information to learn for maybe your future. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Audrey. And thank you to everyone who tuned in, uh, many of whom had answer, answers at the ready for some of the questions that we addressed in earlier lessons. So that is so awesome. We hope you continue to tune in for some of our upcoming live streams. In the meantime, thank you so much once again to the entire team at Wonders of Wildlife. We can't wait to see those selfies, so be sure to post them on Instagram and tag us here at Varsity Tutors, as well as Wonders of Wildlife. Thanks, everybody.